Well, from navigating one conundrum of uh, chasing real life uh, criminals to the next one, now on reclaiming the narrative, women in Indian mythology. Namaskar and good evening, everybody. This is me, Neharika, albeit in a different role now, that of a moderator. And on this panel, I have with me two very accomplished authors. Let me tell you a little more about them. So, Anuja is a best author with a highly acclaimed work, and she mostly writes in the genre of mythology, historical fiction, and fantasy. Mohini, the Enchantress, is her latest work of mythological fiction. And her articles, short stories, and book reviews appear in various publications like The New Indian Express, The Hindu, and Femina. And she is known and highly acclaimed for her debut novel, Arjun, the Saga of a Pandya, Pandav Warrior Prince. And with me on this panel, I have Koril Das Gupta, who's not only an author, she wears several hats because she's also a painter, an entrepreneur, and a professor. So many things rolled into one persona, and she's a compulsive storyteller, as she often says. And she has authored four books, which include three fiction and a non-fiction on Bollywood. Her fourth book has been optioned for screen adaptation, and she's the founder of TellMeYourStory.biz, which is a story ecosystem led by crowdsourced narratives. And uh, for myself, well, I don't have such an accomplished bio, but just that I'm an anchor by profession, and it is my absolute pleasure to be here this evening with Coral and Anuja. I hope you guys are doing well. We are. I am good, uh, Niharika. Thank you so much uh, for such a warm uh, intro. And uh, hi, Anuja. Nice to see you. Hi, Coral. Hi, Niharika. So happy to be uh -huh. a part of this event today. Likewise, likewise, you know, so I feel that we're going to be opening a Pandora's box here in uh, this panel, but we'll have to keep it a little limited because we're short on time. So let me just get straight to the questions. The first question to both of you, uh, you know, we see so many women characters from mythology resurfacing all of a sudden. And, you know, we see this entire genre, which has not been explored yet previously. Why do you think that could be? Or why do you think we have so many people experimenting with women characters or telling the story from their perspective now? Uh, let me come to you, Coral, first. Uh, the way I look at it, that every story gets told uh, from the politics of that era, you know? So mythology is something which is timeless, which has been told time and again, and it will be told uh, time and again across uh, ages, even after uh, us. So in the times that we have crossed, uh, depending upon the politics of those eras, mythological stories had been told to us. And now the stories that I am writing, that Anuja is writing, that other authors are writing, they are a, a different interpretation of the known stories. We are trying to find out uh, uh, those uh, we are trying to read between the lines. We are trying to see what uh, has not been explored enough and very conven uh, conveniently sidelined. But uh, those have extremely uh, relevant portions which needs to be covered, which needs to be discovered, which needs to be spoken about. Because right now, given the politics of this era, given the audience of this era, there are certain things that comes to us as intellectuals, and there are certain things that the audience is ready for. And that is the reason I feel that. Uh, I, I don't think that it is uh, uh, mythology is springing up right now, but at every era in different languages, mythology has always made a very important impact uh, for every audience. Well, I think it's just, you know, the same story being told from one generation to the next. So probably we're adding in our own mix to pass on to the next generation. That's what I feel. Uh, so Anuja, what do you have to say about this? I uh, agree with uh, what Koran said. Uh, she mentioned the timelessness of mythology, and I agree with her 100%. It was here before us, it will be here long after we're gone. As to your question about why we are suddenly, you know, shining a spotlight on uh, powerful women from mythology. I think it's just, uh, uh, it's a reflection of the times we live in. And uh, plus, uh, I think it's a cycle. Inherently, mythology, the retelling of it is cyclical in nature. At one point, uh, you know, the narrators were mainly 
uh, men belonging to a particular community so it was their voices which were predominantly heard and uh, but i've always maintained that at its heart the epics uh, our mythology makes room for everybody it's very inclusive because we've covered so much and uh, it's um, it's nice if you you know now it's now it's nice to give voice to lesser known characters and uh, have people rejoice in their stories as well i think uh, all stories are beautiful they have something to offer and uh, it's just lovely that right now we are doing a lot of women centric mythology Well, I think uh, there are also other spaces where perhaps women need better presence, or they need to reclaim the narrative. Like, for example, sports. We don't have enough representation in sports, maybe. Or, uh, for example, even the corporates. You know, so uh, Kurul, I assume that you have worked a lot with corporates, and we often say this that girls mature faster than boys. Yet, we see so few women in the leadership space. So, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, frankly we see less women in the corporate leadership space but there are no dearth of women in the leadership space because we are constantly leading at our home or outside home because i personally feel that the homemakers are the best leaders they uh, are leading three particular verticals they are leading money management they are leading project management and they are leading uh, people management and people management is the most difficult thing of it all and they just handle it with great elan and uh, at times uh, the women at home they can uh, really take over situations and flatten the curve with uh, the kind of finesse and the kind of expertise that uh, your uh, iim degrees can't afford you know so i don't believe that women have any dearth of leadership they are constantly visible yes the only problem is we haven't accepted those or we don't take cognizance of uh, the kind of leadership learning that is happening at various aspects offered by women that we have uh, you know grown up uh, kind of taking things for granted taking the woman's work for as if that it is her uh, i mean it is the birthright of the others to uh, get the woman do those chores for them because uh, she has done the great crime of uh, getting married and birthing <laughs> babies <laughs> so she must do those because it is a part of her job description when she was born but uh, increasingly we as just like i am talking just like you have raised this question we are raising these questions and i'm sure we are moving towards the right direction well i think that's a very fresh perspective that we get to hear amidst all the other opinions that are often on social media or any other place i'm going to hold on to that thought of job description for a second i'll come back to you but uh, anuja what's your take on this and uh, do you agree completely with this or do you have something to add to this one well, i agree with what kurul said uh, but to add to it i think uh, uh, it's I, I genuinely think uh, every phase uh, in throughout history have been good for women because women are very smart. Like Coral says, uh, we've always shown leadership qualities in whatever field you choose to be in. And uh, I, uh, I personally think that you know women have never let anything hold them back at any time in history. Even when you know it was a patriarchal society and men called the shots, women have always found a way to make, make a mark. you know in art in literature in science because the women's contributions can never be overlooked if you study history and mythology and i think that's a very inspiring beautiful thing when you look around today and uh, if you feel a little uh, depressed about the lack of opportunities or if you just feel this a little in the quality or something we can always you know just uh, uh, suck it up and find a way to forge ahead you mentioned sports in particular and the corporate world I think there's a, there's room for improvement, uh, not just with respect to women alone. I think the entire sports scene, the corporate scene, it could use an overhaul. We do need to bring in renovations and changes, and it's a very exciting period because women are at the forefront of it. We we all we've never waited for men or the government to do the right thing by us. Women always show extraordinary intuition and. Uh, you know you find a way to make things happen for you even if people aren't offering things on a silver platter so where i've never i mean i've been surrounded by inspiring women all my life and coral said this beautiful point about how homemakers deal with three verticals that goes like 
brilliant i just wanted to clap out loud because uh, i really think homemakers are the backbone of not just this country of the world you know their efforts fuel every single enterprise out there and that's something we can rightfully take pride in as women that we can balance uh, so many responsibilities wear so many hats it's a lovely time to be a woman well i think we have another refreshing perspective here thank you so much for that and now like i said i'll come back to you coral on so i was reading through your latest book earlier uh, and uh, i was going to ask you and there is this point where uh, you know uh, brahma asks ahilya what do you know of being a woman that's a very interesting definition that you've given us here. so why don't you take our view and our readers through that I have read through it, but I would like our readers and our viewers to know more about it. So, uh, actually, it was uh, something that just came to me uh, very naturally that there is a soul, right? And uh, the soul is floating around. Now, that soul is supposed to be untouched completely, right? Uh, a soul doesn't have a gender. a soul is supposed to be untouched completely and then that soul sees the sculpting and uh, it asks that am i a woman that i felt uh, i felt very strongly that the consciousness of being a woman must be something which is so strong that it would come that would that it would be transcendental you know it wouldn't be something which uh which is only uh, uh, you know uh, trapped into one lifetime it has to be something which is far more uh, bigger far more generous and uh, hinduism i mean when i say hinduism i don't mean the religion i mean the philosophy hindu philosophy has never given uh, a person's body so much importance as much as it has given the uh, importance to the soul the mind and it is very uh, uh, i mean over time we have messed up our understanding of these things and we have believed mm -hmm. that the mind is only this part which is a part of our body but it is uh, such a wrong notion because it is actually the mind which is the greater vastness and the body is a part of the mind and when you actually uh, understand that aspect a lot of your learning you know has to be reoriented and you completely take a com different uh, understanding of everything the way you have understood known figured whatever you have thought about yourself whatever you have believed so uh, that is where i felt that when this soul is trying to figure out who she is or what is it about being a woman or a man there must be something very profound and that profoundness cannot be born just uh, cannot be limited to a particular number of years when you are on the earth it has to be beyond that so that was the way i had looked at it well i think that's lovely and it's one of a kind take because i have never come across it you know i've never uh, uh thought of it this way as well that being a woman has to transcend births it has to transcend your time on earth uh let me talk about now mohini which is anuja's book so i was reading through it again and uh, what i find most endearing is that uh, mohini is the narrator of your novel and she is all about plain speak she will say straight away what she has to say she will not try and twist it or she will not try and use any fancy words it's going to be short Good. Was it deliberate that you adopted this approach, or uh, you know, it's just that it came to you this way? No, well, actually, I think uh, at, at that time I was really struggling with uh, Mohini. Some characters uh, are a little more complex, a little more harder to pin down than other characters. So I think uh, initially, honestly, I was panicking and I was thinking, my God, why do I? take up these extremely complicated characters people are always telling me why don't you write a you know something more simple something funny maybe why do you get into these complicated themes and i was thinking yeah everyone's right you know i'm punishing myself and um, but then suddenly you, but, but when you persevere with your characters they'll help you and uh, you know uh, i was um, just thinking okay how do i go about this when 
suddenly i had that uh, you know moment that light bulb moment where i thought okay uh, if, you know the one way to get closer to her would be to just let her speak in her own voice and i think that was the turning point for me because after that it just uh, it was such a beautiful journey from having bang- initially it felt like i was banging my head on the wall but uh, after that it was like just being captured in the flow of her story i felt like i was standing outside and just you know letting the story take shape on its own and uh, it was a lovely experience with uh, mohini to experience her spirit the exuberance of her nature because i think i am a proper geek and i think i've always been very frightened to venture out and you know explore my desires to just go when i must be me because i do have an impulsive side but i've always been scared and i just love that she uh, have this character who's deeply just she's a mystery coach her desires lead her and i found her so inspiring and i think it helped me deal with certain personal um, you know restrictions which i imposed on myself which is just another beautiful thing about these characters right? they help you a lot more than you do you know people always say you're giving a voice to unknown characters and i'm always thinking you know yeah like it's this profound thing to say but i'll be thinking no happy like you know i didn't do anything these characters have done more for me than i've done for them well i think taking off from there so i just had a quick thought in my mind while you were talking that uh, since we are the writers we get to paint our women characters the way we want and the way we define strength can also be different for each mythological character so even though we've known them through stories that we've heard in childhood even though we've known them through perhaps you know movies or television representations still while we are writing we can give different meanings to uh the strength of a woman so to both of you uh if you had to define strength how would you do that so i think yeah. we can go uh, first okay uh the way i see a woman's strength uh, which is actually the uh underlying thought of uh, the series that i am writing the sati series the panch kanya uh, series uh and that while writing that uh something that i realized about the strength of women uh, from which this uh, particular idea of sati comes that uh, a sati cannot be touched and once again when i say touched uh, hindu philosophy doesn't talk about the body because uh, it the body is temporary it talks about far bigger aspect which is the soul and the woman's so, uh, soul is very difficult to be touched uh it is often joked that a woman is difficult to be pleased that is the real reason for that is uh she has herself set her benchmarks too high and her expectations from herself is so high so that governs everything around her right and she probably deals with mediocrity in a particular way which others might find uh, a little uh, intimidating at times now when it comes to sati the way they define it is that uh, sati is someone who has been untouched and when they say untouched it means that uh, they uh, they cannot be moved from their uh, resolve very easily you know which actually boils down to their patience it boils down to their resilience so if they have set their head on something they have that extreme patience and extreme resilience to take whatever it takes but see to it that they have given their blood and sweat and soul to what they want till their last uh, energy last bit of energy that i think is the biggest strength of a woman and uh, when it comes to this uh, discourse of sati the same thing flows that uh, for example today uh, on social media there are so many people saying so many things so in today's context if i have to try defining sati then probably sati is that woman who is not touched by whatever and i use the ter- term touched very consciously so sati is probably that woman who is not touched by what others are saying she is very clear about her understanding or her uh, conscience when it comes to defining the rights and wrongs of her choice that is sati in today's context and that i think is the strength of the woman in different perspectives 
Beautiful. I think that's quite beautiful. Uh, I would love to hear from you, Anuja, now about the same thing. I think uh, Shakti, strength of a woman or man, I'm not going to go with gender here, but I think uh, strength comes in many, many forms. We tend to acknowledge only the obvious, which is physical strength, uh, the triumph of might. That's the only thing we value in today's world. But uh, I think it's so much more than that. Shakti is not something that can be defined or contained in a box. It's something that's boundless. It's something that defies comprehension. And I think one of the most beautiful aspects of the feminine divine of Shakti, which animates all in existence, is that, um, of course, uh, you know, uh, Shakti does have what it takes to be a warrior. We worship Shakti in her warrior form as well. But uh, I think more than that, what inspires me is that, uh, you know, there's so much tenderness, there's so much compassion underlying that tremendous strength. You know, uh, I, I love that Shakti can show you a better way, a, 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 be a, a way to be a better version of yourself. Now, if you take all the sinners in mythology, you have your Mahishashura and, uh, you know, all these uh, the much reviled Asuras. I've always found that, uh, you know, in all these stories, the uh, people, of course, talk about the killing of this Asura, whether it's Ravana or whatever, but nobody talks about what came after. Nobody talks about salvation, which had been placed within their reach, that all roads lead to Shakti at the end, whether you take a path of bloodshed and hatred and violence. I love that uh, Shakti gives you hope that nobody is uh, beyond redemption. Everyone can find their way home. Everyone can be better. Everyone can leave the worst part of themselves behind to embrace all that is, uh, you know, brilliant about them. I think uh, that is what true strength is, not messing up exactly, but finding the strength to get up, to acknowledge that you've done something terrible and to make amends for what has been done, to restore balance. This balance, I think, is, you know, the most... Um, powerful part of strength, finding that balance to, you know, uh, reconcile all that is contradictory inside you, all the warring forces, both within and without, the ability to balance on that knife edge, that is strength at its most divine. Well, I think I couldn't agree more on both these perspectives. Uh, now, since both of these are mythological characters and, you know, they must have taken a fair amount of research and work and drafts and redrafts, I just want to know a little about both of your processes. How did you uh, go about your research and how did you go about penning the entire books that you have? Uh, so uh, let me let me go to Coral now. Uh, actually, with Ahalya, it has been uh, much easier because uh, people didn't know enough about Ahalya. They just need a, knew a little bit. And uh, there is not enough literature as well about Ahalya. So I did a few reading. And uh, anyway, I was uh, comparatively well-read in mythology compared to uh, many others in my generation. Mm -hmm. So I <laughs> was uh, already pretty uh, in it uh, when it comes to mythology. Uh, so Ahalya, it was a very smooth flow. And uh, often, uh, that is what happens to me when I am uh, writing that I just, just like uh, Anuja said some time back, that uh, whatever I write, uh, I think these characters come and they get the stories written. Actually, that is what happens. And I couldn't agree more with her that actually that is what happens. You just feel that the character has come there and it's trying to, uh, you know, uh, talk to you and tell you what it is or how it is. So Ahalya happened like that. Now that uh, I'm writing Kunti, Kunti is actually giving me you know, a lot of sleepless nights because uh, one, there is too much literature on Kunti. Uh, not that people, many people have written about Kunti, hardly any. But uh, in the peripheral, uh, Kunti's peripheral uh, space, has been extremely well explored and Kunti's name has featured in those too many times. So, you know, my challenge is that I have to escape from the complication and still tell her story, which is again equally complicated. 
so uh, i am trying to do every kind of you know uh, uh, i am trying to do every kind of shortcut possible i am trying to run i am trying to uh, fall <laughs> i am trying to <laughs> drown all of that is happening one day i am throwing the laptop next day i am picking it up so that phase is on uh, so i am i am cursing myself but i am enjoying it <laughs> well, i will just uh, pause and uja here for a while before we hear from you since you brought up the subject of kunti so i have to ask you this uh, there are two kinds of uh, characters that are painted when it comes to her in some versions of the mahabharat she comes across as very manipulative but in a few others uh, for example i can recall b r chopra's television uh, serial mahabharat she's painted as somebody who has a very soft heart so who is your kunti which side does she have manipulative because <laughs> i do believe that uh, the the manipulation is also a very uh, solid uh, you know a, a very solid uh, identity of the woman and not all, every time manipulative is negative manipulative the word has uh, many connotations and it can be explained in many ways and kunti the way i have uh, looked at her she is a queen and a queen is a diplomat right i have to, uh, tried to explain her decisions from that perspective that's interesting i'm sure that's going to be one very interesting read and i'll look forward to it and now coming back to you anuja on the previous questions so uh, do tell us what you feel uh, regarding the working process uh, again the research parts are a lot of fun but it can also be very distracting because there's an ocean of material out there to wade through and i'm always getting sidetracked because uh, there are there'll, there'll be some character in mohini's life who interests me and suddenly i'm chasing this rabbit down a hole and i keep disappearing here and there and you know my notes are so copious uh, i do it the old fashioned way uh, i jot it down using a pen, a pen in my diary and al almost always uh, when i want to go back to some little uh, tidbit it will always be something which i didn't jot down so you know i'll have to go hunt for it all over again and it's a merry chase you know i fall down i pick myself up i get panicky but uh, you know ultimately uh, the thing with indian mythology it's it's that it's a, it's like a living breathing organism as far as i'm concerned because so uh, we have such a rich tradition of oral storytelling which was later put down and everyone's voice is so fascinating everyone who's worked in this genre they put a little bit of their heart and soul so it's just lovely to be part of that it feels like a collaboration it feels like we are all in this together we all contribute a little more to you know help this beautiful organism this beautiful soul you know which is made up of little bits and pieces of so many people's hearts minds souls it's uh, you know it's so lovely to be a part of that and slowly um, as an author i think you feel you've succeeded when your character refuses to listen to you when your character just goes ahead and does her own thing like a very troublesome child right so you know initially i used to try and control it but uh, i think 11 books down the line now i just surrender to that process and that surrender itself is so fun for me because i'm a control freak ask my children they'll tell you about uh, you know the military <laughs> <laughs> aspect of their mother so you know but and yet in this space i just love that feeling where i'm just uh, you know completely uninhibited and um, you know with mohini it was like that and again since uh, she's um, people always bring up mohini's character when we're talking about uh, lgbtqia characters in uh, mythology i wanted to make sure that uh, you know i did justice again you know you could argue that uh, since uh, i'm not a transgender person i really um, may not capture the essence of it so you know again i tried to not focus so much on the political correctness correctness of it all and to simply concentrate on capturing the essence of mohini so that's what i tried to do and again it became very simpler when i let her do her thing and i just sat in the back seat and just enjoyed the day Well, that's when you know. I you know. Uh, if I may just uh, tell this to Anuja because I was really enjoying what she was saying. Uh, I often noted when I was small, and my grandparents would tell me stories from mythology. I noted that often grandfather's version was a little different from grandmother's version. Grandmother would, you know, uh, tell uh, the same story, 
with a little empathy towards the uh, women characters or a little she would you know conceal a little cruelty part and grandfather would be more you know robust in talking about those so i would often say but he said that it is like that so she said yes that is right but it happened this way so that i i still remember i was remembering that when anuja was talking actually right. i am reminded of my mother she would have been told the very you know a censored version of all the myths and i adore shattering all those myths for her for instance uh, <laughs> for instance with kannagi who burnt madre i'll say ma you know uh, she actually plucked out her left breast and hurled it at the city like a nuclear missile and my mom would be horrified and i'd say in the ramayana ma shurpan uh, lakshmana actually chopped off shurpanaka's breast ma she'd be like why 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 do you have to tell me these things because she likes <laughs> that sanitized glossy yeah. pretty pretty version which she'd been told by her grandmother and i like to <laughs> bug her by setting her temperature right up to roof with you know the versions i've uncovered through my reading <laughs> so it's just so <laughs> funny Well, I think that's the beautiful part about characters. You know, you know that they are characters when they don't listen to you, and also about stories. So we have our own narratives, we have our own sides. I think it happens in everyday life also when we are narrating an incident to a friend or maybe a colleague. We will just add in our two cents, or we will just say, "No, no, this is not what happened. This is what happened." Okay. So since we've been prompted uh, by the organizers, one last quick question to both of you. uh now our present culture the president so- uh, present society that we live in uh can in a lot of ways be said to be a mirror of the society that we had back then uh it seems to be deeply rooted in tradition so according to you are there some traditions that need to evolve with the times that we are in some that we can we can completely do away with or you know it should remain as it was back then uh so i think uh, see traditions i think we all are constantly uh making peace with things that we believe is uh, is right for us i mean i know that uh, for example uh i have very strong spiritual side and i believe in god but i don't uh, take my bath early in the morning and stand before the temp- temple and do my bhagavad but uh, that doesn't happen with me it's not that i am disrespectful towards those who do my husband does but even when i tried i found that what is traveling in my mind is something completely different in front the deity is sitting i am standing before him i have been given prayers to to chant i am chanting but it is not making sense because in my head i am thinking something else it doesn't make sense to me so i don't do it but my way of believing in god is that trust him for the decisions that he has taken for you i mean that's i'm talking for myself that i trust god for the decisions that he has taken for me even when things are not very happy not exactly the uh, way i would want them to be i don't blame god i definitely question him that how can you do this to me but i don't blame him in the sense that no you must change it that i never do because i feel that he knows my life from top to bottom so if he has done something he knows the best he has put me into it he will take me out of it so obviously this is not something which uh, is happening at every household obviously every house has as you understand that my mother in law was different my mother is different my husband is different but i today have taken that diversion to say that i don't think this is for me right that is an evolution in the family which uh, nobody is contesting because people have started understanding at least in the urban space i have that uh, say within me that please don't force me because uh, i believe in doing it differently and people have understood they may not have understood my take uh, that why am i saying this but they have understood that i have something which uh, i am not being able to uh, negotiate with and so i would be at better be left alone so there are many such uh, rituals which we are constantly negotiating with and we are constantly you know trying to find peace with doing things in our own way uh, those will constantly keep happening yes there are many such rituals of uh, for example all those uh, signs of marriage i find them beautiful but i wear them only when there is an occasion my uh, yesterday generation they are more regular with those i am not so these 
things we will sometimes uh, you know compromise we will sometimes adopt things will change the way they want to but i do believe that so the most beautiful rituals that we have will never change they will stay in some way or the other they will definitely stay absolutely to, uh, uh, just to mention what you said i think tradition itself was not always very traditional i mean you go back several centuries and it's not like they were all like so goody goody and following all the rites and rituals you know it, it, everything just kept changing the definitions of tradition keep changing 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 all the time so you know now everyone would think that nudist colonies are a western thingy you know which happened in modern era but actually if you think about it during the bhakti movement there was uh, the saint from karnataka mahadevika uh, you know she was she chose to be to appear in the nude and she would use her long tresses to cover herself that was all she used to cover herself so you know again she was she may have been unconventional for that period but she did write passionate poetry her work has survived to this day and she was considered a saint of the bhakti movement so what is traditional then today if you were to take off your clothes and say i'm going to adorn myself with my hair you know it would uh, be a big thing you'll be splashed all over social media and people will yell at you for not being traditional for forgetting your roots so what is roots what is tradition i i feel that you know from every age you can pick up what works for you and that's going to vary from person exactly. to person take the best of the past what whatever that may be mean to you and try not to judge others who's you know uh, idea of tradition is not necessarily the same as yours and we also need to understand that conventionality itself is not morality it's not necessarily the best way to live your life you know whatever works for you different strokes for different folks and just throwing cliche after cliche here but the idea is you know whatever works for you don't apologize for that and don't judge others who do something which is entirely at odds with what you think is the best way to live your life well i think we may think these are clichés but for a lot of people they may not be but in any case you know those are two very wonderful views that we have here and those are wonderful closing remarks and what i have also personally felt is this that uh, if you look at anything which you say defies tradition has probably existed in some or the other part of our history so i quite agree with that that we need to define tradition first and we need to define how to evolve out of it as well But thank you so much, Coral and uh, Anuja, for that lovely, lovely conversation. I was beginning to think that now is when we are beginning to warm up in the conversation, but uh, time is pressing like always. So we will see you some other time, and I hope that we do get a chance to uh, meet each other again, even if virtually, and take this conversation forward. In any case, thank you so much. It's been great having you here this evening. Same here. Nice seeing both of you. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. Thank you so much, Coral and Nikarika. We'll definitely, you know, continue this over coffee sometime. Hope our paths cross. Absolutely. Cross soon. Look forward. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And now it's uh, over to the back end team to uh, for the next panel.